Grandpa had five boys, and four of them were shooters. And uh, my dad stayed in it the longest, but he he quit that about 1964 or 65. But my grandpa worked for an outfit called Independent Eastern. Well, your depression came on. And for five years, they paid him to sit at home. He never left the house for five years. Never shot a well. And finally, the big man for Independent Eastern came up, and they let him go. But they said, you can have everything that you've got up here. Truck, nitroglycerin, shells, magazine, it's all yours, free of charge. Good luck. Well... That worked out just right, because right after that, it started in, and he made some serious money. But it worked; it just worked out perfect. It was perfect timing for him. And so my dad got into it, and some of his brothers got into it, and Grandpa taught them, and they bought a glycerin factory down by Pahuska, Oklahoma. And my Grandpa hired an old man down there. His name was Ori Bartles. Uh, I don't know when Ori started that, but he started making glycerin back when there was a patent on it. The guy with the patent is the guy that was shooting the wells, making the glycerin and making the money. So a few people decided, hey, he's making some money. We want in on this. So they started making theirs in a creek. You had to keep the heat down on it because that's where you got into trouble. And Ori said a few people got blown up in the process. But he was a past master at making nitroglycerin. And Dad told me that uh, you could tell the difference in the glycerins. You could tell when they shot a well what the glycerin they made, which was clear. Okay, DuPont's glycerin was yellow, like beer. It had too many impurities in it. And he said you could tell when that shot went off whose it was. Because the clear had a lot more bangy to it than the yellow. But he, he taught Dad and one of Dad's brothers how to make glycerin. So they went down and they made their own glycerin. They, I think uh, a run of glycerin was 1,300 quarts at a time and Ori worked for him all the time and uh, they would go down and they'd spend a week down there making glycerin 1300 quarts a run and it made them sick uh, the, you, you take uh, glycerin oil sulfuric acid nitric acid and you mix them together in a nitrator and the fumes off of that stuff just gives you terrible headaches just, man, you're sick. Anyway, he'd come home and it'd take him a day or two to stay in, in bed and he'd get it where he felt all right. So then he'd go back to work, you know. But they, they shot wells around the clock. It didn't matter when it was time to shoot a well. If it was 2 o'clock in the morning, the fellas had the pipe pulled out of the well. It's time for you to be there. So he, he was out all the time, you know, just, it didn't matter. And he he did real well for himself. And if he finally, he bought the company from my grandmother. My granddad died in 1946. And I don't know, in the mid fifties or so, dad bought the company from her. And he just ran it by himself then. Uh, his brothers had uh, gotten other jobs because things had kind of slowed down. But still, he, he was pretty darn busy there for a good 10 years before he finally quit it. But uh, it is a little dangerous. Well, it's more than a little dangerous. It's very dangerous. The only insurance company that would insure them was Lloyd's of London. And that was a little expensive. We'll say you've got a well you want to shoot a 50 quart shot in it you want to shoot 20 feet of sand okay yeah, there's a formula i've got a card in my pocket i could read it off to you but uh 
It's so, so a, a torpedo shell, a certain size, will carry so much glycerin, and he figures it out to where you're going to shoot 20, uh, 20 feet with 50 cores. He said, makes shells up that long. Okay. Then he goes out, and he will run what he calls a dummy, which is just a short shell full of cement down the hole, and, and he, he'll zero up his measuring meter. And he'll come back out of the hole. He'll hang one shell in the, off the hook in the hole, and he'll pour the glycerin in it. Then if he's going to shoot, say, run two shells, he'll hook the other shell on top of it, let it down, fill it full of glycerin. And if you're going to run a bomb in it, why, they'll take and put a cave catcher on top of that, which is like an upside-down umbrella when it goes in the well. That enables you to pour gravel down the hole, and it won't set the shot off because it's getting caught in that umbrella. And the umbrella stops the shock wave of the gravel hitting the water. Okay, and they'll bridge that shot in with rock, and it's got a time bomb on it. And if they, they want to set it for 12 hours, well, he'll set it for 12 hours, and then when the 12 hours is up, he's standing there waiting. <laughs> he's never had one that didn't go off. Or he'll drop what they call a jack squib on it. If they're just going to let the water, say it's got a couple of hundred feet of water on top of the shot, why he drops what they call a jack squib, which is just a tin shovel with a stick of dynamite in it, and you just light the fuse and drop her in the hole. And he said, usually the dynamite didn't go off. When that shell smacked the water, the concussion set the shot off 200 feet below. That's just pretty touchy when you can drop something like that and it'll set it off 200 feet below. Just a concussion of the water. It's a little touchy, but uh, he said very few of the dynamites went off. Usually it was it was just a concussion set them off, but uh, they they have a tendency to come back up the hole pretty bad if you don't bridge them in with rock, you know. And boy, it really makes a mess. It just <laughs> stuff flies everywhere. He was he was very good at what he did. And, and that, then well, there was only one accident, and that was that Pete, the uncle that, or well, my grandpa's brother. And he was the only one. And of course, nobody ever knew what went wrong, you know. He was shooting the well by himself out there. The rig hands were all gone, gone home. Just everything's gone, you know. They don't know what he did, what went wrong. The only thing they found in him was his heart sitting on a fence post. That's what they found. The rig, truck. Everything just gone, blew her away. Well, there'd be pieces of it laying around, you know. But boy, I don't know how big a shot he was putting in it, but it was enough that it took everything, made a mess. Grandpa had a magazine out west of Garnett there where he kept all his glycerin in it. And one Sunday afternoon, Dad and him was standing out in the backyard where I live now. And a couple of guys was fooling around, and Grandpa had an old dog out there, and they stayed up on the blacktop road, and they're going to shoot that dog. They hit the magazine and touched her off. It had around 500 quarts of glycerin in it. And boy, that made a mess out of things. It blew a big hole in the ground. It just blew the, all the, it was in a hay field. It just blew it bare, just like the floor, you know. And uh, Grandpa bought a lot of windows. <laughs> Dad said that went up in the air about two miles and just mushroomed out and just shook everything. One of my uncles was in Richmond, which is eight miles north of Garnet. So we heard her up there, looked down there, could see that going up. But yeah, Grandpa bought a lot of windows. <laughs> he, uh, he was born in 1914. So he was, he was probably, I don't know, 40 some years older, right close to 50 anyway, when he bought it. And uh, he did real well with it. Uh, he bought a new truck in 1950. 
and he, of course, he kept that, and uh, it's out here. But yeah, he bought the truck new, and they and he, they made the bed for it themselves. Him and my uncles, they they made the bed for it. They had they'd bought in a bed for another truck, and they liked that so well, but it was expensive. They decided, well, we'll just make our own. So they did, and they did a good job on it. You couldn't tell it from the factory built one, but it'll it, it's capable of hauling 300 quarts. But that's a lot of bangy. You know, it's. I know he was coming from Oklahoma with a load of glycerin on the stock wagon, which is a 1935 Chevy ton truck, and he stopped and had a tire fixed on it. And he got up the roadways, the tire come off. And man, he was mad. He, after they got, it should have set the glycerin off, but if for some reason it didn't. He got, I had some help there and the mechanics come out and they put the duels back on the truck and he went back into Oklahoma. <laughs> oh, I'm, uh, I'm glad I wasn't that guy. He was really hot. But uh, yeah, you could sure set her off that way. You, you, you drive for yourself and the other guy. You have to, you know, somebody cut you off or you know, whatever, you're in trouble. Because it doesn't take that much of a jar to set that off. See, those that, those glycerin cans are 10 quart square cans. They fit inside a rubber boot that you just almost have to just push the can down in it. There's a thick felt blanket underneath that, all those boots, and those boots are all crammed in there together. I mean, there's no room for any movement. It has a thick floor in that glycerin compartment. You have another thick felt blanket that lays down on top of it, and the door you shut on top of it is that thick. There's no way it's going to move, but a sudden jar is not good, you know. But just to move, you know, sitting there doing that, it's not going to do that. It'll just sit still. Yeah, you have it. If you're in an accident, there's no recourse for that. It's going to go up. So you got to drive for yourself and the other guy. Yeah, yeah. All you'd have to do is have the horses spook one time, and you're gone. You know. But yeah, I've, there's a picture out here of that. And he's got his torpedo shells tied on the side of the buggy, and he's glistering boxing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh boy. Dad told me he when they started using cars. He said he liked a Buick because the Buick rode softer than any of the rest of them. So he, he, he drove Buicks until he started buying trucks. Okay, when Dad basically quit shooting wells, he bought a drilling rig. So by the time I hit 13, I was big enough to drive rig stakes and dress bits. So I went out on the rig in the summertime, or sometimes on weekends, you know, whenever they were, what made the difference what they were doing. But anyway, yeah, that's when I got started. And it just kind of went from there. When I got out of high school, I went to work on a drilling rig and I worked for well, about a year. And then I went on to other things. And I ended up retiring from the telephone company after 40 years, so yeah. Uh, I tell you what, I would not, nah, under any circumstance, <laughs> trade that. But boy, I wouldn't want to do her again. Whew. That dressing them bits rough on you. It really is. Yeah, I, I wouldn't trade that for anything. But man, enough's enough. <laughs> when Grandma had the company, that fracking was first getting started. My Uncle Henry put together a fracking truck. It was a GMC. My Grandma bought a new Jimmy truck, and Henry made a fracking outfit out of it. And they they used it around there, and they, they just finally sold it and quit doing that. They just kept it on with the glycerin. 
But that, that fracking has become the way of life now. That's the way they do all that stuff. The nitroglycerin was just, it, it was too dangerous. Uh, it took you too long to clean things out after you shot a well. You had to go in and spend a, probably a week in there with the drilling tools and the baler cleaning all the slop out of the hole because you pulverized things. You just turned it into mush and you had to get that out so you'd have a cavity for your oil to come into. And you, we spent a lot of hours cleaning out, but uh, you had to do that. Like I say, it just turns everything into mush and you fractured that oil sand way back out and that lets your oil bleed in through the cracks. But when you frack, when you frack one, that frack sand goes out in that crack and it holds that crack open and it lets it bleed in better. Then, then the glycerin, the glycerin really, it just turns her to mush. You can have a you can have a shot hole down there as big as a house just real easy if you hit her pretty hard. Dad told me the hardest shot she ever ran was right down south of Garnett down there on a, on a lease down in the bottom, 100 quarts of crack. That's a pretty hard hit. <laughs> yeah, he said there was shot holes down there that you could put a house in real easy. They uh, they would uh, take and set their trucks up with some high pressure pumps on them, and they pump sand and water down the well, and they did it at an extremely high pressure. I can't tell you how high they went up to. I know I was working on an oil lease while while I was going to college, and I worked on the oil lease in the summertime. Okay, they fracked some wells out there and uh, Halliburton come out there and they had one well that wouldn't break down and take what they were trying to force down it. So the engineer, he just kept giving them the thumbs up and bumped the pressure on her. Well, they kept bumping things and bumping things. Pretty soon the truck's sitting there creeling. <laughs> The lines are digging themselves into the ground. You know, they're sitting there shaking, digging down. The engineer just kept giving them that. And so finally, the fella running the truck just threw the throttle forward, just dumped down behind the dash, just let her go. They never did break that well down. She just wouldn't take it. A shot would have done good there. But the fracking just, she didn't work. Not on that one. But that was an exception to the rule. Most of them would break down and go, but not that one. It's a thing to come out on Dad. Dad had to put on his shot card. This is a, a shot card he'd give the customers, and it tells you about glycerin, and it tells you what it costs to shoot a well. Uh, like, for instance, a 50-quart shot is $247. But that's back there about 1950. You know, it's a lot different than that today but uh, this uh, this is on on nitroglycerin it says has a constant initial velocity of approximately 23,600 feet per second nitroglycerin contains an excess of oxygen and it explodes very uniformly and at a very high velocity and pressure it also delivers the same force per volume regardless of the static pressure above it or the resistance of the material being blasted. At the moment of explosion, one pound of nitroglycerin delivers 156.7 cubic feet of gases, which move at the rate of approximately 23,600 feet per second. developing an energy of 2,120,000 foot-pounds of pressure at 150,050 pounds per square inch. That's a lot of banging. Yeah. Yeah, he's, they, it was remarkable that they didn't have more accidents, you know. I know 
the fella down there in Oklahoma by the name of Hughes, one of Dad's friends, he was a shooter and he had a glycerin factory. But Dad's they were real particular. If you spilled something, you cleaned it up immediately, you know. The floor had a kind of a, a linoleum type floor in there so that nothing soaked into the wood, you know. And he cleanliness was just like a hospital in there. Well, this Hughes fellow wasn't quite that way. And they got a fire started somehow in his factory. And they all took off <laughs> running, you know. What can you do? And they ran out there quite a ways, and when she went off, it just knocked them flat. But he come over and worked in Dad's factory, you know, asked Dad if he could, you know, rent it or whatever, make glycerin. Dad said, yeah, but you'll clean up. And he made them stay clean all the time. But, yeah, they blew their, theirs up because they, you know, just if something spilled on the floor, just let it go. She was soaking. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's pretty interesting if you get into digging into some of that, what they did. There's there's a lot of stories. I know uh, he told me one about uh, a fellow by the name of Judy. And it was one of Ori Bartle's stories. And that Ori made glycerin with him. Ori was real tidy. Judy was not. And Ori had problems with him over that. But he said that, that old Judy took a, a load of glycerin down into Texas. Had, I don't know, 800, 900 quarts on the truck. It was a Model T truck. And he took his brother-in-law with him. They got off now going to some magazine down there in Texas. And I don't know, they, they met a car. But the car was a ways away. And all at once everything was gone. Just and that fellow driving the car, he took the front end out of his car, blowed all the windows out of it. It's one that didn't kill him. But he told Ori and then told the authorities that it looked like something fell down under the truck. That something went down and it just phew, gone. Well, they think it broke a U joint and the dry shaft come down and whipped up into that bed full of glycerin, set it off. Well, they were right in front of a farmhouse. Of course, the farmer and his wife, the house, barn, the whole works left. You know, I mean, you got eight or 900 quarts of glycerin on top of the ground. Man, that's a blast. And like a, like a fool, I asked Dad, I said, how'd they know who did it? He looked at me, he said, well, they wait and see who doesn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he got him and his brother-in-law and two farm people. That's, that things like that happen, you know. Who'd think that the U-joint was going to break in the truck, you know? But that's what happened, that's according to that other fella. But it's it's different. It's 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 very unstable. You might bump at one time. It's okay. The next time it may get you. And it freezes at 55 degrees. And when it's solid or in a gel type state, it's way worse than when it's liquid because the jar is so much harder. If you bump something, the jar is much greater in something that's solid versus a liquid. So if it freezes, they got to put an antifreeze in it. When they make glycerin, they put ethylene glycol in it, enough to make it where it went to 22 below. That way it wouldn't freeze up because you, you shot wells year round, you know, and you couldn't pour a can full of frozen glycerin. So that's how they handled it. Put a little, little ethylene glycol in it. But, and then he had a little stove, a salamander type stove that burnt real low and they kept that in the magazine. After they had the magazine, they got the whole shot in it they didn't want to buy any more windows, so the next one they built, they lined the walls with cement. <laughs> uh, shoot.